What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to talk about 10 brewing mistakes that I have personally made that I want you to avoid and how you can avoid them yourself. I have personally made every single one of these mistakes, so this is all based on my experience. The first is buying expensive stuff that you don't need. There's a lot of brewing gadgetry out there. Some of it is very good, but some of it is not. And some of it is not really necessary unless you're actually operating a production brewery. And while we all love to really emulate the professional brewers in the brew pub down the street or in your favorite craft brewery, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna make better beer. Uh, a lot of this equipment will make you feel like you're making better beer and will maybe make things more convenient for you, but they won't necessarily make better beer for you. You have to build the skills yourself as a brewer in order to make better beer. So this can be stuff like a hop dropper system. This is uh, a relatively expensive way to dry hop under pressure, but um, is it really fully necessary? Because there's many other ways you can do that. You can use silicone coated sous vide magnets to hang a bag of dry hops inside your fermenter so that if you're dry hopping under pressure, all you have to do is release the outer magnet and it lets the whole thing fall into the beer without ever opening the fermenter. This is a very low budget way to dry hop and it makes complete sense. This can also be like a clean and place system. I bought one of those once and I tried to use it and you need a very, very powerful pump to clean in place on the homebrew scale. And that's another hundred dollar investment as well. So not necessarily something you need if you're just willing to use a little elbow grease. And also it could be fancy ways to monitor your specific gravity. Something like um, my Anton Part Easy Dents. These are cool things, but they're not necessary at all to make a good beer with. But it gets more expensive than those. Do you really need a glycol chiller? Do you really need a can seamer? Do you really need fancy stainless conical fermenters? Most of the time, the answer to those questions is gonna be no. But it does depend on your personal situation and how much you are willing to spend on this hobby. Number two, kind of in converse to that one is, well, it may not be a good idea to buy necessarily tons of expensive equipment. It's also not necessarily a good idea to buy really cheap equipment either. Buying poorly made equipment from questionable manufacturing origins can result in bad beer. It can result in oxygen exposure from bad seals. It can result in metallic off flavors from bad welds or low grade stainless steel. Or if you're using tons and tons of plastic in your brewing, it can result in harboring an infection if you're not careful about cleaning it or leaching plastic chemicals into your beer. So be careful about buying cheaper equipment at the same time. It may not last a very long time either. I found a lot of the inexpensive brewing setups and the inexpensive brewing equipment does not last a long time. It is very easy to break in the rather harsh environment that brewing is. The third mistake to avoid is rushing your beers. Uh, it is all the rage nowadays to try and make an IPA in three days. And yes, you can do that, but it's not gonna be even close to what it could be if you actually let the IPA condition and you gave it some more contact time with the hops. You gave it some time to really develop. Um, the same thing is true of any beer that you're trying to rip out in three days. They're not going to be at all what their peak potential would be if you had just fermented them over the course of one or two weeks. Beer in the grand scheme of things compared to wine, compared to whiskey, compared to other alcoholic beverages does not take a long time to make. If you're patient enough to let a regular beer last one or two weeks in the fermenter before putting it in its package as opposed to just rushing it in at three or four days, you're gonna be rewarded. The thing is that actually multiplies exponentially when we're talking about strong beers. So if you're making a double IPA, a really strong Belgian ale, um, a Russian Imperial Stout, all those things need months and time to condition and be a much better version of themselves uh, than if they're fresh. Sometimes these beers really do need that time. The fourth mistake to avoid is scorching your beer. Um, this is something I've personally done at least twice. When you have a high protein mash and you're heating it with an electric element at a low temperature, you're gonna scorch the beer. If you're decoction mashing and you're ripping the heat on that thing, really trying to get it to boil quickly, you're gonna scorch the beer. Same thing is true if you have a direct fired kettle and you're trying to ramp the temperature on your mash up really fast, you're gonna scorch the beer. Be patient, be careful with those things, and use a gradual temperature change over time. Any one of these things will result in your beer tasting like an ashtray, and it's not a good flavor, and it will not go away either, so do be careful about that. The fifth mistake to avoid is adding in lots and lots of additional flavors. 
So for example, adding in random ingredients to your beer that you don't necessarily know what they're gonna do, adding in lots of them, adding in fruits, chocolates, coffees, spices, um, random other things. <laughs> I mean, you could add pretty much anything to beer that you want, but odds are, if you're adding in a lot of it, it's gonna overpower the flavor of the beer. You wanna think also about how are you gonna blend that flavor in with the base beer? How does the base beer support the flavor? Does it make it better? Does it clash? Does it not work? You ideally want to experiment around with this a few times before you actually perfect that recipe, but um, just try to give it a little bit of critical thought and try to figure out whether or not it's gonna work. Some flavors definitely can be very harsh and very bad uh, when they blend with beer, especially also when they ferment. Keep in mind, when you add fruit to a beer, if it's not an extract flavor, it's probably gonna ferment, which is gonna leave it much, much more tart than the actual fruit flavor. And the same thing is true of various types of sugars as well. The sixth mistake to avoid is hop creep. Um, this is something that happens relatively easily when you're dry hopping. Hop creep, in short, is what happens when you dry hop a beer and uh, there's enzymes in these hops that actually go ahead and they chop up more starches or long chain sugars and turn them into short chain sugars which are fermentable by the residual yeast that's in the beer. Um, and that residual yeast will actually go ahead, consume those sugars, and then create diacetyl. If you've ever dry hopped like an IPA and had it turn into like a buttery kind of vegetal flavor later, that is the diacetyl from hop creep, and it is not to be messed with. So usually the best way to resolve this issue is to just simply give your beer a little bit more time to condition at room temperature after you dry hop. So dry hop for like three to five days, pull those dry hops out and let this thing condition for another one or two weeks at room temperature to help mitigate that hop creep. This again goes back to number three, avoid rushing your beer. This is another reason why quick IPAs and heavily dry hop beers that are only three or four days old are gonna not turn out so good. Number seven, avoid using chlorinated tap water and make sure you're doing the right water chemistry. Chlorinated tap water is gonna result in chlorophenols in your beer or a Band-Aid medicinal flavor that is not good. Uh, kind of like cloves on steroids. This is easy to prevent by just using store-bought spring water or distilled water for your base water or by letting your tap water sit out overnight to let that chlorine evaporate. You can also avoid this by adding in a Camden tablet or a potassium metabisulfate. That will neutralize the chlorine and keep you from having any sort of chlorophenols formed. But also make sure if you are doing water chemistry, you're paying attention to it. You're not adding way too many minerals to the beer, which can result in a minerally tasting beer. Or you're not adding way too many um, sulfates versus chlorides and resulting in an over bitter beer or an overly malty beer, which can be cloyingly sweet. We want to avoid those things. Number eight, avoid unnecessary oxygen exposure. Don't open up your fermenter unless you absolutely have to. Try to limit the headspace in bottles and in kegs, and if you can, purge them with CO2. All of this will help your beer stay fresher longer. It will keep it from oxidizing and turning an ugly shade of brown. This will have a nasty muted cardboard off flavor, and it will just generally reduce the amount of flavor that the beer has overall. You don't want this in your beer, and it is unfortunately rather easy to have happen if you're not careful about your process. So do try to limit the oxygen exposure overall in your brewing and you're gonna have a better time. Mistake number nine is not letting your beer chill down to the appropriate temperature before pitching yeast. No matter what's going on, I usually like to try and pitch my yeast at about 65 Fahrenheit. This is low enough that it limits the potential for fusel alcohols and for diacetyl to form and for all of these other pitching related off flavors that can happen if you either don't pitch enough yeast or you pitch it too hot. Pitching too hot will create a very nasty fusel alcohol character that is just absolutely unpleasant and will not go away in your beer. Uh, it's an easy way to ruin the beer and I've done it because I haven't paid attention. Don't feel like you're absolutely screwed if you can't get your wort's temperature down below like 80 or 90 degrees uh, before pitching your yeast. Just let it sit, let it naturally cool off over the course of like, I don't know, overnight or over the course of the day to actually cool down to the right temperatures. Honestly, it's a much worse result if you pitch your yeast hot than if you don't chill fast. And the final mistake to avoid making, and this kind of leads into uh, most of the others on this list that I've made is drinking too much on brew day. It's kind of funny, but it's also kind of true. Many of us will enjoy a beer or two while we're brewing. There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is when you have too many and you're not really thinking or you're not really planning out properly, you're not paying attention to details, um, 
or you worse yet get sloppy and start like tripping on stuff or spilling things, that's gonna cause a lot of problems. My general technique is I will not have any beers until the mash is complete and I'm beginning to boil. That means there's only one or two hours left in the brew day and I'm, you know, I'm not gonna really screw anything up if I drink a beer or two over one or two hours. Just manage yourself, especially if you've got some friends over um, and try not to get distracted. So I hope you enjoyed the video, you learned something, you found it entertaining. Uh, please, if you did, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button as well, and comment down below. What are some mistakes that you have made that you would like the world to avoid doing based on your own experience? If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up this t-shirt or many others like it down in the merchandise store down below the description box or in the description box. You can find links there. I also would like to thank my Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. You are helping make this channel so worth it, and you are helping upgrade the production quality and do a lot of good stuff for the channel. So you have my thanks. If you want to support in other ways, I also have a channel memberships option. You can hit the super thanks button if you feel inclined to do that as well. All of those things are greatly appreciated. I also have an Amazon store where you can find all of the equipment that I use to brew with and um, also the equipment that I like to film with as well if you're curious about that. And last but not least, I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check that out for some more frequent content updates than just YouTube. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate your time. So until the next one, cheers.